Clear to land, runway 17. The pilots attempt their first landing just after 9 a.m. They try to line up with runway 17 and descend to about 100 feet from the ground, unless they can clearly see the runway. Go around. Roger. Go around. Ten minutes later, the crew decides to try a different tactic. They hope they'll be able to see more clearly with the sun at their back. Doesn't seem much better. But they still can't see the runway. Go around. Visibility at touchdown zone is 500 meters. Only with the pilots opted to try runway 17 again, instead of diverting to a different airport. On February 10th, 2011, a small commuter plane named Flight 7100 crashed at Cork Airport in Ireland, tragically killing six of the 12 people on board. This crash isn't just about what happened on that fateful day. It's about a much bigger mystery involving an airline with strange practices, an aircraft with a confusing history, and a flight crew with surprising inexperience. What was going on with this airline, and how did its business practices lead to such a tragic event? First up, let's look into the history first. Manx II was a unique and somewhat unconventional player in the aviation industry. Established in 2006, the airline operated with a business model that allowed it to avoid many of the overhead costs that traditional airlines face. Instead of owning any aircraft, Manx II leased planes from other operators and contracted other airlines to fly them. They operated under the virtual airline model, which allowed them to sell tickets create flight schedules, and market themselves as a full-service airline, while never actually managing any of the critical elements of an airline operation. This was a major departure from the traditional airline model where airlines own and operate their own aircraft. The Isle of Man, where Manx II was based, provided a unique opportunity. Despite being a small island, it had a significant demand for flights, particularly to the UK and Ireland. The larger carriers, however, weren't interested in serving such a small market, and Manx II sought to fill that gap. They leveraged the flexibility of smaller regional planes to provide short-haul flights. This allowed them to offer low-cost alternatives to passengers without the heavy expenses associated with large commercial aircraft. By leasing planes from various operators across Europe, Manx II could tailor its fleet to the needs of its routes. However, Passengers were often unaware that the airline they bought tickets from wasn't the one actually operating the flight. The branding on the planes might say Manx II, but the crew and aircraft maintenance were outsourced to smaller carriers. This arrangement allowed Manx II to maintain a minimal operational footprint, but it also introduced significant risks, particularly when it came to ensuring consistency in safety standards and crew experience. While the virtual airline model may have appeared cost-effective, it relied on a patchwork of third-party contractors who operated under different safety standards and operational procedures. This arrangement often resulted in confusion and a lack of oversight, both for passengers and regulatory authorities. In essence, Manx II was able to run a cheap, low-risk business, but at the cost of transparency and, as later became evident, safety. Manx II's approach was founded on keeping operating costs as low as possible while maintaining the appearance of a full-service airline. By using smaller planes, they significantly reduced their fuel costs and avoided some of the expenses associated with larger aircraft, like extensive maintenance and large cabin crews. These aircraft typically required fewer crew members, reducing labor costs and contributing to a more affordable ticket price. For passengers looking to fly to and from the Isle of Man, this was an appealing option especially when traditional airlines were not offering affordable alternatives. The airline's routes were primarily short-haul, meaning they didn't require the extensive infrastructure or long flight times that larger airlines would typically need. Manx II's flights typically connected the Isle of Man to nearby airports in the UK and Ireland, catering to a niche market of travelers. These routes allowed Manx II to operate in a market where demand was present, but the high costs associated with larger flights made it unattractive to other airlines. The smaller aircraft used for these routes were easier to fill, and the airline could offer cheaper fares as a result. However, the downside to this model was that smaller regional planes, often flown by pilots with fewer hours of experience, 
posed a higher risk in terms of safety. By operating with a limited staff and contracting other companies to handle various aspects of their operations, Manx II did not always maintain the strict oversight needed to ensure the highest safety standards. This lack of control over the maintenance and operation of the aircraft, coupled with the cost-cutting approach, led to a higher likelihood of lapses in safety. Manx II's cheap business model also allowed them to sidestep certain taxes and regulatory fees that larger, more traditional airlines had to pay. They did so by operating with smaller aircraft, avoiding some of the regulatory scrutiny applied to full-service airlines. While this kept their operational costs low, it also meant that safety, maintenance, and pilot qualification standards were sometimes compromised. In the case of Flight 7100, these shortcuts would prove to have disastrous consequences. The crash of Flight 7100 on February 10, 2011, would become the defining moment in Manx II's brief and troubled history. Flight 7100 was operated by a Fairchild Metroliner, a small regional aircraft that had been in service since the 1970s. Despite its long history, the Metroliner was still used by many small carriers for short regional flights, largely due to its affordability. However, by the time it was operating under Manx II's banner, the aircraft was old, worn out, and had a confusing ownership trail that raised significant questions about its maintenance and safety. The plane involved in the crash had a complicated history. It was registered in Spain, but it was leased from one company to another, passing through multiple hands before it ended up operating for Manx II. The aircraft was used as a passenger plane during the day and as a cargo plane for the British Royal Mail at night. This dual-use model is far from ideal, as planes are not designed to switch between passenger and cargo flights on a daily basis. The additional stress on the aircraft's structure, as well as the inconsistent maintenance required for this dual purpose, contributed to the aircraft's deteriorating condition. Even though the aircraft had a questionable maintenance history, it was still put into service for commercial flights. This is a testament to Manx II's decision to prioritize low operating costs over safety. It was clear that the plane wasn't maintained to the high standards one would expect for a commercial passenger flight. The fact that Manx II operated such an aging aircraft without proper regard for its safety highlighted the dangerous shortcomings of the virtual airline model, where cost-cutting measures could sometimes compromise basic aviation standards. Despite the growing concerns over the condition of the aircraft, the plane continued to operate under Manx II's name, with little regard for the risks involved. This raised the question, how could an airline, even one with a virtual operation, allow such a poorly maintained plane to carry passengers? Flight 7100 was a tragedy waiting to happen, and the incident would eventually expose the severe flaws in Manx II's business model, which prioritized cheapness over the well-being of passengers. One of the most troubling aspects of the crash of Flight 7100 was the inexperience of its crew. The captain, Jordi Lopez, had only 25 hours of flying experience with the Fairchild Metroliner. This was his first flight as a captain on this particular aircraft, and he was still undergoing training to complete his certification. In aviation, experience is critical, and the ability to handle emergencies, especially on older or less reliable aircraft, can make the difference between life and death. Unfortunately, Captain Lopez's lack of experience on the Metroliner would play a key role in the tragic events that unfolded. The first officer, Andrew Kental, was in a similarly precarious position. He had only 539 flying hours in total, an alarmingly low number for someone entrusted with operating a commercial flight. According to industry standards, less experienced pilots are meant to be paired with seasoned captains to provide balance and mitigate the risks posed by inexperience. However, in this case, both pilots were relatively new and lacked the necessary experience to handle the difficulties they encountered during the flight. This imbalance in experience led to poor decision-making, particularly when the crew faced unexpected challenges. Furthermore, both the captain and first officer were not employed by Manx II directly. They worked for Linius Arias de Andalusia, a Spanish company that was subcontracted to operate the flight. This meant that Manx II had limited control over their training, qualifications, and overall competence. With no direct oversight from Manx II, 
the airline was unable to ensure that the crew was adequately trained for the specific challenges they might face while operating the Fairchild Metroliner. This lack of oversight and the decision to place an inexperienced crew in charge of an aging and poorly maintained aircraft contributed directly to the disaster. The poor judgment of the crew during the final stages of the flight, combined with their inexperience, meant that they were ill-prepared to handle the dangerous weather conditions and technical issues they faced. In hindsight, this combination of factors made the crash almost inevitable. On the morning of February 10, 2011, Flight 7100 took off from Belfast, Northern Ireland, bound for Cork. The weather was bad, with thick fog and low visibility. The crew, already dealing with the challenges of an old aircraft, were tasked with landing in conditions that were challenging, even for experienced pilots. The issue? The pilots were only trained for a Category 1 Instrument Landing System ILS approach, which required visibility of at least 550 meters. However, the weather conditions at Cork Airport were worse than that, with visibility dropping below 200 meters. Despite this, the pilots decided to proceed with the landing attempts anyway. There were three separate attempts to land, and each time, the crew encountered major issues. During the first attempt, they descended too low, far below the safe minimum height. On the second attempt, they came in so low they nearly hit the ground. And on the third, the crew tried to land despite the visibility still being dangerously low. At one point, the captain made a strange decision to take control of the plane's throttles, even though the first officer was supposed to be in charge of flying the plane. This confused both pilots and contributed to the loss of control later on. As the plane descended for the final approach, the pilots tried to go around, attempting to pull the aircraft up and avoid landing. But it was too late. The plane had already banked sharply to the left, and when they tried to correct, it went into a steep right turn. The right wing struck the ground, and the plane flipped upside down, crashing violently off the runway. The crash killed six people, including both pilots, and left several others injured. Investigators later revealed that one of the plane's engines had malfunctioned, which contributed to the loss of control. In addition, the poor coordination between the two pilots made the situation even worse. Following the tragic crash of Flight 7100, several well-known figures in the aviation and safety industries voiced their concerns about the implications of the incident. One of the most vocal was Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger, the hero pilot who famously landed U.S. Airways Flight 1549 in the Hudson River. Sullenberger, a staunch advocate for aviation safety, expressed deep concern about the airline's business model and the lack of oversight that allowed such an aging and poorly maintained aircraft to operate commercially. He argued that the incident highlighted the need for stronger regulatory frameworks, particularly for airlines like Manx II that rely heavily on leased aircraft and third-party contractors. His comments sparked widespread discussion about the dangers of cutting corners in aviation safety, with many agreeing that the industry needed to prioritize passenger welfare over cost-saving measures. Another prominent figure who commented on the incident was Sir Richard Branson, founder of Virgin Atlantic and a longtime advocate for innovation and safety in aviation. Branson expressed his disbelief that a plane with such a complicated history and questionable maintenance practices had been allowed to carry passengers. He called for greater transparency in the airline industry, urging regulators to ensure that all airlines, regardless of their size or operational model, are held to the highest standards of safety and accountability. Branson's reaction was echoed by other airline executives and safety advocates, who saw the crash as a stark reminder of the risks posed by low-cost carriers operating in a regulatory gray area. In the aftermath of the crash, Manx II attempted to distance itself from any blame, claiming that it was merely a ticketing service and that the responsibility for the crash fell on the other companies involved in the operation of the flight. Manx II argued that they did not own the plane or employ the pilots, so they shouldn't be held liable for the tragic event. However, the investigation by aviation authorities quickly pointed to significant issues with Manx II's oversight and its failure to ensure proper safety standards. The airline had outsourced critical operations, such as aircraft maintenance and pilot staffing, to third-party contractors without maintaining adequate checks and oversight. It became evident that Manx II's failure to supervise these contractors played a central role in the crash. The investigation revealed that one of the contractors, 
Flight Line, had significant operational issues, with a history of safety concerns and prior investigations into its maintenance practices. Flight Line was not only responsible for the crew and aircraft, but they were also the ones who managed the day-to-day -day operations of the Fairchild Metroliner, yet the plane had been poorly maintained. The airline had a troubling history of safety violations, including reports of improper maintenance, which had been flagged by aviation authorities. This further complicated the situation and highlighted the systemic problems that arose when Manx 2 relied on companies with questionable safety records. In the end, Manx 2 was forced to terminate its contract with Flightline following the crash, but the damage to its reputation was irreversible. Despite the termination of its contract with Flightline, Manx 2 continued to operate under different names for several more years. However, by 2017, the company ceased operations altogether. During its years of operation, Manx 2 was involved in several other incidents, though none as catastrophic as the crash of Flight 7100. In the wake of the investigation, aviation regulators took a much closer look at virtual airlines, leading to new regulations that required tighter oversight of all airline contractors. Manx 2's failure to maintain rigorous safety standards and ensure that proper maintenance and experienced crews were in place became a cautionary tale for the industry. The airline's downfall marked the end of an era for virtual airlines that operated on such precarious foundations. The crash of Flight 7100 highlights a serious issue in the aviation industry. When airlines operate with such a lack of transparency and oversight, things can go terribly wrong. In this case, a combination of inexperience, poor business practices, and a disregard for safety led to a tragedy that could have been avoided. It raises an important question. When it comes to air travel, how much should we really trust these smaller, less known airlines that operate on a shoestring budget? Is the lowest ticket price always the best choice? Or do we need to prioritize safety over savings? What do you think? Should more be done to regulate virtual airlines like Manx 2? Or are they just a part of the aviation industry that we have to accept? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for sticking with the story of Flight 7100. It's a tragic reminder that safety should always come first, no matter how small or budget-friendly the airline might seem. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to this channel.